Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a great day to be here at Jesus is Lord Ministries International, six to seven miles west of Gettysburg's Circle or Square. And uh, it's off of Chambersburg Road, which is Route 30, out here this far. And uh, anyways, if... Uh, any of you listening in through technology, uh, you know, uh, live anywhere near and uh, it'd be nice to visit you or for you to visit us, I should say, uh, so that, you know, maybe I could even place a face to at least somebody I'm speaking into that camera. Amen. Amen. And I, uh, I just rejoice in having this privilege uh, given to me to be able to uh, speak from Pastor Mike Yeager's pulpit on Friday nights. Now, however, right up at the front, I'm going to let you know, next Friday night, I will not be speaking here. Uh, I definitely have an engagement that I cannot get out of, and uh, it's one that I look forward to uh it, it's a preliminary leading up to a, a great event in my life and uh hopefully in the life of my uh daughter's son my grandson our grandson my wife's my grandson uh, as he gets married and uh pap granddad uh, I don't know how he likes to address me nowadays, but I think he still probably calls me Pap most of the time. Uh, honored me by asking if I would do that, and so uh, I was more than glad to do that. That's the first of my three grandsons getting married, but I won't be here. And uh, I will be, however, substituting for my daughter, Leah Miller on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, she uh, uh, is not going to be able to be here, and so I have graciously said that I'd step in and cover that spot. So uh, what we start tonight, I'll be speaking on come Tuesday evening uh, also, and uh, we're going to be getting into what, what I'm about ready to start. It's going to be a long time to cover. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to do it by the end of the year. I'm keeping you in suspense. Um, I want to also thank uh, uh, Senior uh, Pastor Mike for this opportunity, privilege. And I want to thank his son, the assistant pastor of the church, Michael uh, Yeager. Uh, we could say Michael Yeager, too. Uh, his dad just goes by Mike. But anyways, um, he's faithful at what he's doing as far as being our audio and visual man. And, you know, I like to see people who are faithful, people you can count on. And he is definitely uh, diligent and, and faithful at what he's been asked to do here at the church as far as uh, covering the audio and visual aspect of uh, the services held here at the church. Uh, and whenever he would be ministering, he has a brother that he has somewhat uh, trained pretty good to be able to take and fill in at that spot as the audio-visual individual. So uh, we rejoice and we give you praise. We give you thanks that you are here with us. We praise you because, hey, you're the reason I'm here. Tonight, I don't see a soul in the, in the auditorium. Last, uh, maybe about a month, uh, I may have uh, had some people here, here and there, but uh, tonight, 
the auditorium is empty. And uh, so, so I praise you for, for being there, for being hungry enough to want to tune into something that's being ministered from the Word of God. Let us pray now as we open. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice, we give you praise, we give you thanks. Father, you know of all the uh, attacks to have my attention and mind focused on different other things uh, that, that, that comes about uh, during the day sometimes and throughout the week. And uh, this week's been full of them. But Lord God, I ask you to, Lord God, give me a, a, a steady focus in my, in my mind, in my thinking, uh, to where my spirit can be at peace also as you anoint this earthen vessel to once again minister your great and holy word uh, out to people. And we rejoice and give you praise that, Lord God, you are faithful in that anointing and equipping that. And Father, I thank you, Lord God, for each and every life that is tuned in this evening. We ask now that, Lord God, you would make this word relevant to each of us. That, Lord God, we would, Lord God, be ministered to in the ministry of this word tonight, even according to your knowledge, and that, Lord God, you specifically know how to tell her, fit this portion of Scripture and the message to fit each of our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Take notice whenever I, I prayed that, I didn't say interpret. You see, Scriptures are not open to private interpretation. Amen. Amen. No, it's not open to private interpretation. It's a matter of God meant what he said, and seeing he meant what he said, it is what he said. And we can only know that through the ministry of God's Holy Spirit in us, enlightening and given us the revelation of the scriptures. Revelation and truth. And you know, he does it in a uh, systematic way as we continue to grow in this life that we've been called to, this uh, new creation life that we have in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, tonight, and I said, I'm taking on a feat to try to get this done by the end of the year, but I know all things are possible to those who believe. And with God, nothing is impossible. Now, it would take me working with him to make it a possibility. And it would take me relying upon his wisdom and instruction and total obedience to that in how to bring this about. We're going to cover the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts covers a total of Twenty-five, twenty-six chapters, twenty-seven. How about that? Twenty-seven. Do we ha we have twenty-eight chapters in the book of Acts? And so that means I got to have twenty-eight weeks to car uh, carry. Uh, one chapter a week, so that means we're going to have to cover more than just one completed chapter per week, amen, to get this accomplished. So we're going to trust in God to help. 
Charles to get that accomplished. Amen. Amen. The book of Acts is the second volume of a two-volume set written by Luke the physician. The first account is the book of Luke. The second being, or the gospel of Luke, and the second being the, the book of Acts. Uh, both of these books were written to one named Theophilus. Must have been a, a close uh, friend and comrade of Luke, the physician, in some aspect of ministry. In some aspect of ministry. We don't know much about this guy, Theophilus. Maybe by next week, maybe I'll be able to try to do a, a, a study on trying to find out exactly what kind of information's out there to know who this Theophilus is. <coughs> but uh, the book of Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of the Apostles. These are stories about the apostles and what was accomplished through the apostles in the first century church. In the first century church. The book of Acts uh, starts with the objective of giving the 11 apostles after Judas fell from his place as one of the original 12 disciples and now addressed in uh, the books after the Gospels as apostles. Uh, he fell from that through his uh, denying the reality of what Christ administered concerning his death that was going to be taking place and what would would, would, would be a great benefit to them all once he, he did die. He even mentioned that he'd, he'd, he'd be uh, given into the hands of, of, of men and that no man would take his life, but that he would lay it down. But you see, even up to the time in the Garden of Gethsemane, they had no realization. They were still all, all 12 of them, looking for Jesus to come and restore Israel back as a kingdom, sovereign kingdom and nation again, and freeing them from being under the occupation of the Roman government, the tyranny of occupation by one who had defeated them as a nation. And falling in the fact that Judas Iscariot 
had a weakness. He had a love for money. He had a love for money. And so for the love of money, he agreed with the religious leaders of the Jewish people there in Israel to betray and have an opportune time where they could come and arrest Jesus the Christ. So anyways, we're going to start with verse 1 of chapter 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. Otherwise, when he ascended into heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles, that would be to the eleven, whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days and speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. We're ending there right now in verse 3. I am reading out of the New American Standard Version, in case maybe you, you may not have one that's going word for word as I've been reading. So I'm just letting you know. I try to remember to do that, and for the most part I do use the uh, New American Standard Version. So uh, anyways, so we find out throughout the Gospels, right at the end of them, that Jesus was raised from the dead. And after that, he spent a time of 40 days fellowshipping and proving to the followers of Jesus Christ, which apparently fell down to a pretty closed group of people uh, at this point whenever they either became disheartened or, or discouraged because Jesus didn't restore the nation of Israel back as they supposed the Messiah was going to do, but they didn't realize there was going to be two manifestations of the one same Messiah. One coming as a suffering servant to die as payment and penalty for the sins of fallen humanity. And the other would be then to sit up a kingdom here on earth, setting and taking his authority upon the throne of David. All right? But these disciples... They were like most of the Jewish people of the day when Jesus walked here on earth. They were expecting a great Messiah deliverer to free them from the tyranny and occupation of Rome. And so he walked and he ministered for 40 days after his resurrection from the dead. This is what we have here being brought to us here in the third verse of 
the book of Acts chapter 1. And he was ministering in the things concerning the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God here on the earth. You mean immediately he, he went ahead and threw off the Roman occupation and tyranny? No. What is the kingdom of God on earth here? What is it? Can I get one person here to maybe? What is it? So the kingdom of God basically boils down to it's the church of the believers. It's the post-Jesus ministry here on earth people to bring about God's will here in this earth. to help establish God's plan here in this earth. Otherwise, we basically have been given dominion again on here, here on earth, the church. Even as he gave the first man, Adam, dominion over all the things of the earth. Yes. So that's who we are. We are the kingdom of God. We're his representatives in this earth. To see that his will is done. Amen. Amen. Verse 4 then says, And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait. For what the Father had promised. Now he had spoken to them on many occasions about a promise of the Father. And he was speaking about an event that was soon to take place. Even as what we're reading here on verse 4 of chapter 1. What he was addressing them. He told them to go to Jerusalem and to gather there and not to leave, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. See, he administered this to them. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days after. Not many days after. So he's, he's given a distinction between water baptism that John did, and Jesus himself never did any water baptism while he was here. His disciples may have, but he didn't. All right? And the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, whenever, I know this may differ from what you're used to as far as what baptism may look like, but uh, we believe that baptism should represent what has transpired in the lives of those who receive Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior. So, It gives a depiction of what's taken place in us in that we go under the water, speaking of dying to self, 
and come up in newness of life in Jesus Christ. Amen. We are not to be living like we did B.C. before Christ, before we received Him as our Lord and Savior, making a personal, individual, okay? And that's what's depicted whenever we go into baptism. Well, you see, I believe that's what transpired also in John's baptism. He took them out into the River Jordan. Whenever Jesus was baptized, that's what he was doing at the River Jordan. And he baptized them. And I believe he took them under that water. Otherwise, why have them come clear out there into the, into the middle of the river? In the middle of the width of the river. Why? He did it to demonstrate what would soon be coming. Amen. We represent Jesus' death and his resurrection when we come out. But then we, we identify with that and say that's what has taken place with us. We've now died to self to our human flesh and carnal nature, nature and sinful nature, and have come up in newness of life, no longer in bondage and enslaved to sin, but a new life we have now in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> But anyways, he, he informs them. He says, hey, listen, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, you have to remember, there's an episode spoken in the Gospels where Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when we get converted. At that point, the disciples were converted. They had received Jesus Christ. They understood. Hey, listen. We understand now why he died and said it was expedient that I, I do this. And so, they were converted when he breathed on them. When he came into that upper room and breathed on them, and I believe it was only the 11 there at that time. There is no mention that there was other people there, just the 11. But now, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, some translations or versions of the Bible says uh, there was about 120. I believe the King James nails it and says there were 120. All right? So I'm going to just take it that there was 120 there that, that day. Amen? Amen. In verse 6 it goes on to say, And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time? Now, see, they're still looking for him to restore the nation of Israel back to being a sovereign nation and kingdom. Lord, is it at this time you are going to, uh, you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, listen to what he says here at verse 7. This is important for people to get. 
He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs. The King James says the seasons. Most of the other versions use the word seasons. Uh, but the New American Standard says epochs. But it's, it's, it's periods of time. Okay? Which the Father has fixed by his own authority. By his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come, has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Those who testify, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, you see, he's speaking to the eleven. Some people believe there were other followers of Christ there at that time, but there is no definite scripture that tells us there was. So I believe he's speaking to the eleven. But he speaks about to the remotest part of the earth. Listen, I don't know how much the inhabited earth was at that time, but I believe there's parts of the world that had no idea at all what took place under Rome in that day when Jesus was crucified. So he's including us as being those that are going to be witnesses, those who testify of him, even to the remotest parts of the earth. That means in the parts of the deepest, darkest jungles, that may never heard a word about Jehovah, God, about the one and only almighty, all-powerful God. So we still have some work to do for us, I imagine. I imagine there's... There's tribes of people that have not been reached yet. They're discovering new tribes periodically down through, through the time that we're, I've been alive that they didn't realize existed before. Verse 9 now, we're going to talk about what took place here on that day? The ascension. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up or taken away or taken up while they were looking on, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, watching this happening, while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. I believe this was angels, okay? It addresses it as two men. How does the King James address that? Same way, two men. I don't believe they were mere men. I believe they were angels. Now that's Charles's belief. Okay, I believe I'm in good company. I believe most theologians believe that they were angels. And they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? 
This Jesus, King James says, this same Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Amen. Now they're telling them, hey, there's coming a day when he's going to come back in the clouds just as he was taken up in the clouds. For the church, I'm just going to call it the catching away of all those who have believed upon and received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, both living and those who have died previous to this event of Him returning back into the clouds, into the sky, and He's going to catch us and snatch us away and that's going to bring abruptly the end of what we call the church age. But all believers, those of the old covenant, those who were there whenever Jesus Christ gave his life, and all of those proceeding up to that hour in time that have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and received Him as Lord and Savior, the Old Covenant people looking forward to the promise of the Messiah. God's salvation being restored to mankind in a way that would put an end to the need and requirement of animal sacrifice. Because Jesus became the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world before all the ages began. It was already determined in the mind and the heart of God for His only begotten Son to be the last and final sacrifice with the shedding of blood and the laying down of life. The first Adam brought sin into the world. The last Adam, He brought an end to the bondage of sin in God's creation of humanity. But it's only for those who receive that great salvation. Amen? Amen. So he's going to come in the same way, even as you watched him go into heaven. Now, we're going to get to an upper room experience. Remember the last upper room experience before this one being addressed here, starting at verse 12 of the uh, first chapter of, of Acts? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tune you in. It was the Lord's Supper. It was he and his apostles, his, his twelve, coming and partaking and celebrating the Passover. Now, you want to know what the Passover was? Hey, go to the Scriptures, go back, and find out, starting in Genesis, where God calls Moses out to deliver the people of Israel from out under the tyranny and slavery and bondage of Egypt and go forward from that place. And you'll find out about the Passover. See, I, I expect you to study the Scriptures for yourself also, instead of just relying on men that, that are called ministers of the gospel 
in whatever facet that calling is. Because, you see, we all need to study the Scriptures. We all need to read them. We all need to prayerfully approach those Scriptures, asking for the Spirit of God to bring us light and understanding and complete knowledge of the truth of God's Word. You see, this is a spiritual book. It can't be understood just simply with the mind. But the Spirit of God ministering to our spirits, once we've received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, revelation, knowledge, and understanding is brought to us. And we understand it in truth. Why? Why truth? It's truth because, you see, the Holy Spirit is a part of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Spirit does not come to speak of Himself, but rather to speak of and testify and minister knowledge of God the Father and God the Son. Amen. Hallelujah. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All right. So now this is the 11 went up into the upper room. The same upper room that they had had the last supper before Jesus was arrested. These all, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And at this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons. I'm just going to say 120 people who were followers of Christ before his death. And they were there together and said, Brethren, the scripture has to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold (coughs) by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. I already spoke about that here in the opening. For he was counted among us and received his portion. Otherwise, he received a place in the close gathering of followers that Jesus had brought into his ministry. In this ministry, now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness. The money he got for betraying Jesus. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. You know, Judas is only one of two people who is dressed as being the man of perdition. I know I brought it up if you followed me long enough, you've heard me say this. Judas, and then the Antichrist, are both called 
the man of perdition or the son of perdition. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language the field was called Hak El Dama. Or Dama, however you want to pronounce it, and that is the field of blood. Why? Because he burst asunder. He burst in half. And his bowels were poured out. He, his blood came gushing forth from him when he hung himself. And that was one, one rope that didn't hold the, the one that was self-lynching himself. <laughs> or else what he had the rope tied to didn't hold. Okay. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his homestead be made desolate, and let no man dwell in it, and his office, or his portion that he had, let another man take. And it is therefore necessary that the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us was here coming in and coming out amongst us beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us which at this point is 10 days ago one of these should come a witness should become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now that's the only scripture that gives us any idea that there was more than the 11 there at the day of ascension. And they put forward two men, Joseph called, called Barsabbas, or Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed, and they said, Thou, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen. Now they prayed this prayer, and at the end of this prayer, going to seem strange to you what they did. But the end of the prayer is, says, to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. To go to his own place. I think there, there could be the direct interpretation of that and say, well, he bought that field. That was his, his place. Or it could be where he eternally found himself in that second when his body hit that ground and he was torn asunder and his, his bowels poured out. Otherwise, when he died, his place that he woke up in was in the place of torment, in a place of deep darkness, in a place where the fire burneth and it makes people thirst, that even that rich man asked that Lazarus be sent he even just dip his finger in a little bit of water and put it on his tongue. And they drew lots. Now I tried to take and find out exactly what's this lots. Apparently it was short pieces of wood. And apparently, because there was two to make a decision of, they had to at least have three. Because two of them were going to be the same length 
and one shorter, but they were going to be held up where they were all at the same height from what you could see. And I suppose it had to be the one that pulled the long one, which was Matthias was chosen. Today, we would make the comparison is, is people would say, well, let's draw straws. But in my trying to understand what lots was, it was small pieces of wood. Okay? And so the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Otherwise, he took up the office of Judas. Now, in doing that, what was Judas's direct office? He was the treasurer. So I have to believe Matthias might have became the treasurer for the apostles. And as normal, I'm somewhere about six minutes over, and I'm going to shut this down. But next week, we're going to get into chapter two, and hopefully, after chapter two, we can start picking up to where by the end of the year, we'll complete the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Amen. Which actually, I like to say was the act of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The acts of God in the church. Amen. Amen. So thank you for being with us tonight. I'll see you all for chapter 2 on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. because I can't make it next Friday night. I have an important engagement that I must keep. God bless you. Have a great week and go in the strength and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessed Holy Spirit in you. Amen.